All right. Thank you so much all for having me here today. It's a, it's a pleasure, of course, to talk about my favorite subject, cat kidneys. So I unapologetically, as my world resolves around kind of a kidney-shaped sun, what I would like to do is kind of talk about some of the concepts that we've been talking about for the last two days and really channel it towards the kidney and what that clinically might mean um, for chronic kidney disease. So very much a lot of the things that we know in this arena are related to cats, as I hope will become apparent to you as I talk about that disease process and that species. And so again, as similarly disclosed, um, this is uh, kind of the results of my research and opinions, and then of course I'll be talking about other information that's available in this regard. I do have some speaker disclosures, um, none of which are pertinent particularly to this um, presentation. And so what I really want to start um, talking about is the concept of renal aging, which is probably not something that we really think of enough clinically um, in the veterinary setting. And we've talked about these changes with age in many different systems. Again, this concept of a decreased capacity to cope with both normal and abnormal stressors. And so bottom line, if you're a 17-year-old individual versus a 70-year-old individual and you have an insult to your kidney, you may have very two different outcomes when it comes to repair and regeneration in response to that injury. And that's really this concept of how capable is that kidney of recovering from an event. And in humans, there are some good definitions of renal aging that are out there. There is a known and uh, defined decline in GFR with age, and there are some different components that go into that. So many people are really uh, familiar with this concept of eGFR. We don't really have that on the veterinary side. It has not been able to be successfully applied. Um, some people have tried. But there's also histopathologic changes that happen associated with aging in the human kidney, even before you get clinically apparent kidney disease, which is a really important point. And what that's described as would be tubular interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy, and secondary glomerular sclerosis. Now, if you're familiar with the histopathologic lesions of feline chronic kidney disease, that probably sounds pretty familiar because that's pretty much exactly what we see in the cat kidney. And so really we have to kind of ask, uh, what, is the, what is the correlation there? And another really component of this, um, interesting component functionally from the, from the clinical aspect, is what this means to renal transplant success. So there's definitely a lot of researchers out there that are thinking about kidney health in terms of transplant biology. And the elderly kidney has decreased success with transplantation. So if you're on the verge of getting a kidney transplant, you definitely want the younger kidney. <laughs> that would be a really important thing. If, if you have a choice, if someone offered you the 17-year-old kidney versus the 70-year-old kidney, I would, I would go for the younger one. Because um, unfortunately, there's a difference in terms of uh, prospective outcomes. And that very much has to do, again, with this concept of renal aging and how it responds to injury. Additionally, there's the whole concept of cellular senescence and how it applies to kidney health as well. And so again, cellular senescence is that arrest of cell division. And what does that senescence mean for the health of that kidney? What does senescence mean in disease? So we'll be talking a bit more about that. And I'd like to frame it, again, particularly to the kidney. What do some of these concepts mean? And as these things start to become available and uh, clinically apparent to us, how do, how do you approach that from the veterinary standpoint? So I'm going to go over senotherapy and what that might mean to us clinically. What I really want to think about, though, also is what are the implications of this when it comes to chronic kidney disease? As most people know, um, if you're in the veterinary field, feline chronic kidney disease is very, very common, particularly in the aged cat, right? And it's considered really to be a, an aging disease. So the incidence of kidney disease very much goes up with age. Um, and we know in other species that age is correlated with kidney disease and renal senescence is also correlated with kidney disease. So you have an intertwining of these basic concepts already before we even start to really talk about our veterinary species of interest. And so for me, what this really comes down to is the implications for the etiology of clinical chronic kidney disease. Because the big question is always, well, how do all these cats get chronic kidney disease? How do, how do we get there? What is actually renal aging? And what is actually clinical chronic kidney disease? And on the human side, it's actually not quite that clear. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding that. Is this change in that client 
uh, in that, in that uh, patient, is it just renal aging or is that actual clinical disease? And there's a lot of really interesting review articles in that regard. And truthfully, when do you then cross the line into uh, clinical disease? And so to me, when I apply that to the cat, I think about, well, how does this explain Again, what is renal aging? What is disease? And does this explain progressive chronic kidney disease versus non-progressive kidney disease? We've, we've, a lot of us have probably seen that elderly cat that has a creatinine of 2.2 and it's just been that way forever. And that is just not that cat's clinical problem. So is that actually renal aging and not some type of progressive kidney disease? And that's, again, just not the major struggle that that patient has. So those, I think, are some very interesting questions that I've considered in this particular arena. And again, this concept of, well, how did we get here in terms of etiology of kidney disease? Everybody asks the big question. You know, what causes kidney disease? What are our current theories about that? And I'd like to address that a little bit because that's some of the questions that we've had looking at the concepts of senescence in kidney disease. Again, trying to explain how did we get to the clinical part um, of this picture. And right now, um, I think the, the biggest prevailing theory would be that the kidneys of those cats have taken progressive hits over the time, over their life. What those hits are, no one can agree on. And I think it's very <laughs> unlikely that it's the same process. It's po probably very multifactorial. There could be multiple things that happen that cause little injury events, and that these things just build up over time and then eventually culminate in clinical disease. And then when you add potentially in that aging component to it, that might be exacerbated or accelerated in the elderly patient. So this is currently kind of the schema that we approach, um, approach this clinical picture. And so moving into that, I thought we, we originally described this as a paper that we did, Dr. Shannon McClellan as part of her PhD project, describing the histopathology, um, histopathology um, in relation to our iris um, scheme of staging for kidney disease. So what do those lesions look like as kidney disease gets worse and worse? But the other question we actually asked, having some preliminary data here, was what do the lesions look like in young control cats, so that's YC in this graph, versus geriatric control cats. And we saw a little bit of glimmer of interest. If you see, um, again, that, that young cat category is green in this graph and the older cat category is blue, we had a significant difference in lesions histopathologic lesions between the young cats and the geriatric cats. And that really caught my interest because it was the first indication we had that in fact, there might be histopathologic changes. And these cats were well characterized. There were cats that died of non-renal diseases. They had a normal creatinine, a normal urine specific gravity, and their kidney had to kind of pass muster on histopathologic exam as well. It couldn't have a significant amount of lesions. And from this preliminary data, we thought, well, we'd better take a closer look at this. And we spent then several years trying to collect the kidneys of non-kidney disease cat kidneys that had died in various ages to see what it might look like. What does, again, those histopathologic look like uh, in the kidneys of non-affected cats. Again, they're clinically normal. No one would ever guess anything was wrong with their kidneys. And in fact, you see something very similar to what they see on the human side, that we get this march upward with age of lesions in the kidney. We have increasing tubular atrophy. We have increasing glomerular sclerosis. Fibrosis scores go up as well. And this is really describing, again, those lesions and their increasing prominence with age. And so this is, this is probably a good way, I think, from the standpoint of pathophysiology, of showing that, in fact, that elderly normal kidney is probably not that normal, and it's likely susceptible to um, injury events. I want to be as careful as possible with that elderly kidney when I'm approaching that animal in the clinic setting. And so there are a couple of other factors that might come into play for cats as well. Um, this picture, so looking at this picture, we actually have a, an area of inflammation here um, in the middle. We've got tubules that are outlined in pink. Um, this is actually a trichrome stain, so you have fibrosis shown in blue. And if you look at this picture, ask yourself, is this a normal cat or is this a chronic kidney disease cat? This is a pretty, this is a prominent lesion in the cortex of the kidney. This is actually a normal cat, a normal geriatric cat, and you have a very um, evident lesion. So this is type of things that we were counting. 
Furthermore, one of the things that we think is actually quite important to pathology in the feline is the concept of tubular lipid and interstitial lipid. So if you again look at this picture, you can see areas of tubules where you have like a, a very well-defined, um, you have a very well-defined area, can you see that? Yep, so these tubules are quite pink, you see them quite well, but in the lower right-hand corner, there's actually a lot, of, a lot of white areas in those tubules, that's, that's tubular lipid. And for whatever reason, the cat as a species has a lot of tubular lipid. And we actually looked at that in that study as well, and there is an increase in tubular lipid with age as well. So they're accumulating that tubular lipid. Furthermore, there's an increase in interstitial lipid. And if you look at this lesion, the white circular area right in the middle here with the asterisk, that's interstitial lipid. Interstitial lipid is very inflammatory, and one of our big theories in terms of, of etiology is that when you get tubular damage, you have lysis, rupture of those tubules, and they release their lipid into the interstitium, which sets you up for um, that inflammation to form because of the inflammatory nature of that interstitial lipid. So the more little damage events you have, now you're setting off this process in terms of having that inflammatory nidus in the interstitium. So it was very interesting to us as well to see that those lipid scores increased with age. And again, this may be leading us towards additional, um, I guess, susceptibility to injury and the snowballing of this process with age. And so then because of these injury events, because of these potential repair events, we also really want to think about how that senescence piece comes in and what does that mean? So when I apply the concept of senescence to the kidney, what am I really thinking of? And I'm thinking about, again, all these stresses, all these injuries that are happening throughout the life of a cell. In this case, the proximal tubular epithelial cell particularly. And so we have DNA checkpoints throughout the cell cycle um, that are basically going to help us in terms of making sure that things stay healthy. If there's irreparable damage, that cell may then go to apoptosis or it may become senescent. Um, two big choices in terms of the outcome of that cell. We know that senescent cells accumulate with age and they have a very important role in terms of tumor suppression. So again, this is me as a non, there are a lot of very smart individuals in this room, but again, I'm, I'm taking this concept and applying it to kidney disease um, and saying, well, how does this look in terms of my disease? How would I measure senescence in the kidney? Well, at the moment, we're kind of limited to what we can see in renal tissues. We actually don't have a lot of good ways to um, measure this in the actual patient. And so I can look at things like uh, beta-gal, which was mentioned um, already in this conference. We can look at P16, P53. These are all markers. Um, and we basically can also have decreased expression of markers of proliferation. So if I was trying to demonstrate that this process, is, this process was happening, this would be something that I would look for. Why do I care? Well, from the standpoint of kidney disease, I very much care because SAS, SASP has been mentioned as well, so senescence-associated secretory phenotype. We're basically having a pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic um, effect of these senescent cells. So, all of these negative uh, mediators, they have paracrine effects on neighboring cells within the kidney, and you will also have unhealthy repair after injury. And all of these processes then would be a major driver of fibrosis. And we consider fibrosis to be the end stage for kidney disease, right? I'm trying to prevent the progression to end-stage kidney disease and fibrosis. So that's why thinking about, well, how do I intercede in that process? So from the standpoint of renal injury, it's kind of, again, how, what will the outcome be? Will you have a healthy repair process? So if you're on the top, you may potentially, um, you know, you may have a good outcome in terms of your uh, recovery from injury, or you may have a negative outcome in terms of your recovery from injury, where you actually set up a number of senescent cells, and then they may have negative effects on the rest of the environment. So again, we have a, and unfortunately, we have a very poor understanding of what drives those processes and what may have you, may have you uh, a good outcome versus a negative outcome in this regard. Age does definitely have something to do with it. The other thing that I find really fascinating from the standpoint of renal literature is also looking at um, the concept of infectious nature of SASP. So there was one relatively recent study that demonstrated that, again, when you have this repair process, we have 
um, proximal tubular epithelial, epithelial cells that are damaged within the kidney. Um, and then the cells that try to make up and repair the kidney are referred to as scattered tubular-like cells. And so basically, they are responsible for that repair and repopulating the cells of the tubule. And you can see in this picture, um, that's kind of uh, described. So they facilitate this tubular regeneration, but they can also become senescent. And it turns out if you actually transplant those senescent scattered tubular-like cells into a normal kidney, you will induce damage to the neighboring proximal tubular epithelial cells. So this, this concept, again, that there are pretty profound paracrine effects that can occur as a result of those senescent cells. So for me, from the standpoint of kidney, I found these types of studies to be really fascinating from understanding uh, that, that effect. What is that bystander effect? Um, so again, when you transplant these cells, you can have inflammation, fibrosis, capillary damage that occurs, clinical parameters like increased creatinine, and then renal tissue hypoxia. Hypoxia is a huge driver of fibrosis as well, and I'll talk about that in more detail. So this concept, again, of what really the implication of the senescent cell in the kidney is, is I think is, is quite important. But let's take a step back and talk about what actually causes renal senescence. Um, so there's a, it's described in the literature, there's two major pathways by which you can develop senescence within the kidney and how that relates to renal aging. Um, so that's what I would like to talk about a little bit more. And the first pathway we'll talk about is related to telomeres. So, and that is the concept of replicative senescence. So for those of you who are, have not thought about telomeres recently, I would encourage you to do so. I think that the telomeres are important structures. We should all be thinking about them, but they are a protective end cap on chromosomes and their length is regulated by telomerase. And importantly, what happens or is thought to happen is that telomeres shorten over time. So the more replication events you have, the more damage and repair and damage and repair and replication, you actually shorten that telomeric segment at the end each time that happens, and you can see in that picture that that's occurring, to the standpoint where that cell is considered to no longer be viable, and then again goes into one of those, it may be go into ap apoptosis or it may become senescent. There's also ways that your telomeres can be damaged without shortening, and they are uh, very um, sensitive to oxidative stress. We'll talk about that as a mechanism as well. That can also lead to senescence. So telomeres are important in this particular aspect. What shortens telomeres? Well, there are so many, there's so many articles. There's so many, you name it, it's probably shortening your telomeres. If it's fun, it's probably shortening your telomeres, okay? So if you're not supposed to be doing it, it's probably shortening your telomeres, <laughs> basically. So, uh, you know, everything, lots of, the, lots of factors that we talked about today, stress. So every time I'm having a bad day, I'm like, there goes a telomere. <laughs> Um, the, the number of studies out there is just baffling, honestly. So, you know, world pollution, marital discord, you name it, purportedly they shorten telomeres. So we, we really need to think about, again, all, this is multifactorial, right? All of the things that are feeding into this. But really, um, what we want to think about, again, is bringing it back to the kidney. What types of things, what is the implication of that for chronic kidney disease? Well, in humans and in, in rodent models, um, we know that we have a correlation between short telomeres and chronic kidney disease. And we also know that really common secondary complications to kidney disease like hypertension, proteinuria, proteinuria those are also associated with telomere dysfunction. And really importantly, I was, I was really interested to see more recently, there's been articles that have come out that show the association between short telomeres and greater all-cause mortality in human chronic kidney disease patients. So now you have these clinical outcomes as well in actual patients, as opposed to us always wondering how applicable our rodent models are. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really interesting take on this whole scenario. So what do we know in cats? Well, this was part of my PhD project, was using a telephys methodology to measure telomere length in the kidney. So we were able to use this fluorescent um, IHC to actually look at the telomeres in specific areas within the kidney. So this is a proximal tubular um, epithelial cells, and those pink dots are telomeres, and you can actually measure the length of them. And so what we discovered in this particular study was absolutely feline chronic kidney disease is associated with shortened telomeres, and this concept 
likely of replicative senescence, which makes complete sense when you think about all those damage and repair episodes that are happening. But one of the theories we had going into this project was we would actually see shortened telomeres in the geriatric cats, and maybe this was part of the reason why those elderly animals were being set up for chronic kidney disease. And we did actually not see that. We did not see telomere shortening in those geriatric cats, but we didn't have a very large population of geri cat, geriatric cats. Since then, we've also demonstrated in a larger population of cats, still could not prove that to be the case. But also we did not assess telomere dysfunction and the effect that might potentially have on the scenario. But suffice it to say, there is definitely a relationship here. And the reason why I care about that is that there are, of course, also many articles out there about telomeres as a therapeutic target. So the concept of preserving telomere length, preserving replicative health, addressing things like hypertension and proteinuria, decreasing oxidative stress and inflammation, these other things, preserving or trying to prevent renal injury, doing everything you can to preserve telomere health in the first place. And then also the concept of telomere reactivation as a potential therapy. Um, so we did confirm the presence of telomerase in the feline kidney, um, and that sets us up for at least the possibility of using therapies to um, try to reverse some of these aging effects. That's been done in rodent models, um, and still I think a little bit up in the air in terms of uh, what the cancer risk associated with that might be. But again, we're looking for therapeutic targets, right? And the telomere might actually be on the list as a therapeutic target. The other big pathway that I want to talk about then is um, the stress-induced senescence pathway. So this is where oxidative stress and DNA damage might come in. And we have a few um, fairly commonly used biomarkers in this area. P16 and P53 are two of them to mention off the top. There's a lot of literature about that. I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on P16, but again, how does this lead us down the path to that concept of renal aging? So what do we know about P16? Well, it's a biomarker that's obviously used on the cancer side as well, but it has a lot of press on the senescent side too. And so definitely um, what we know from the kidney standpoint is that it is increased with age alone in both the rat and the human kidney, and it's correlated with those age-related changes in fibrosis and tubular atrophy. We also know that it's increased in human chronic kidney disease kidneys and going back to that clinical outcome, it's prognostic for transplant outcomes. So if you look at the P16 in transplanted kidneys, if you have lower P16, you have a better outcome at six to 12 months after transplantation with that kidney. So again, kind of tying it to clinical outcomes, I think is, is really fascinating in this regard. So that's kind of why it caught my interest in terms of, well, what could we show in this way? And then furthermore, again, it's of interest as um, an interventional target. There are a lot of studies, um, knockout, like knockout mice, um, studies showing that if you interfere with P16, you potentially have improved renal outcomes, like increased tubular cell proliferation, decreased ap apoptosis, decreased capillary rarefaction. So I think that's important to consider then, well, what do we know about P16? Could we get to this standpoint? So we did look at P16 in the feline kidney. And again, these are not complicated studies, but we need this basis of characterizing the pathophysiology so that we can better understand what we have um, in kidney disease and what therapeutic targets we might be able to start to take a look at. And the really, this was, this was a very exciting outcome for me because this is kind of bringing home what we'd been looking for. We did find that P16, that marker of senescence, was correlated with age in cats without chronic kidney disease. Very nice correlation there. And furthermore, it seemed to be specific to certain areas of the kidney. So it was actually increased in the corticomedullary junction of the cat kidney in geriatric cats. And that was of interest because that's an area in the kidney that has been spe specifically mentioned previously as sensitive to injury. So there's some KIM-1 studies out there looking at response to injury. Um, KIM-1 staining increase has uptake in this area has also been documented, and this is kind of the S3 section of the tubule. So for whatever reason, we think this area of the nephron in the cat might be more susceptible to damage than other areas. Maybe that's a susceptibility to ischemia, et cetera, but we worry about how susceptible the feline kidney is to ischemia. 
And so when it came to chronic kidney disease cats, then we did see an increase in staining in cats with chronic kidney disease, even more so than the geriatric cats. Furthermore, just like we have seen in other species, that P16 was correlated with fibrosis, inflammation, and glomerular sclerosis in the cats. So we're setting ourselves up for a nice story about you know, what that senescence marker looks like in the cat. So if I bring together everything that I've gathered so far for the cat and ask the question of what evidence do I have for senescence, I know that feline aging is associated with renal senescence. We showed that in one of our studies. We have stress-induced senescence of P16. We have beta-gal positivity for them. But then we know that feline kidney disease is associated with accelerated senescence on top of that. So you very quickly, in, in the disease process, you get to this point where it's even worse. It's, it's snowballed. And you can understand from that histopathologic um, you know, view of the kidney how that would occur. You're getting those injury events, you're getting that inflammation, that lipid is a nidus of inflammation as well, and then this, this process just continues from there. So again, when we're thinking about therapies, um, you know, we have this as a basis to go forward and say, how, how could we help our cats if we know this potentially is going on? So what is senotherapy and how could we apply it clinically to kidney disease? Well, I want to give, again, a bit of a clinical view of, of watching the literature, seeing what's coming out, and kind of organizing this. How do, how do I look at this? So we have multiple strategies where we might be targeting senescence in the patient. I could prevent senescence in the first place. I've already touched upon that a little bit, but we'll talk about it more. I could modulate SAS, so that's referred as xenomorphics, so the, the drugs in that category or the substances in that category. Or I could actually clear the senescent cells, target them specifically, so senolysis and um, senolytic medications that might be coming across um, in the literature. There's a lot. You'd be, I think when I first started thinking about this, I don't even know that many of these things might have been available. And now, literally just in the last day of talking to folks, three more substances that I didn't even know were being studied are being studied and could eventually, you know, in the near future, be in your clinic. So I do think it's really important to understand these substances, understand what category we're talking about, and what the reality of this actually is. So the very first thing I would mention is prevention of senescence. This is probably the most clinically applicable at this time. Be kind to the kidney, okay? So think about that aged kidney. It's struggling. It's had a long day. It's had a long life. Uh, you know, um, so the aged kidney, again, this concept of the reduced capacity for repair. It's just waiting for that wrong drug combined with some vomiting and diarrhea and a hypotensive anesthetic dental to like just be kicked over the edge of the cliff, okay? So that, that's what I'm always thinking of when I see that elderly animal. And we see that so commonly clinically. We, they come in, they're, um, you know, they're in acute crisis, and we look back and we're like, oh, there it was. Your kidney actually wasn't really as healthy as we thought it was before X, Y, and Z happened. So that's a very basic concept that I, I can't say enough. I'm always thinking about those poor little tubular cells just bursting after they have an injury event and leading us down this path. I also really want to think about limiting the triggers of senescence. Again, oxidative stress, inflammation. And then again, as I mentioned, P16 is a therapeutic target, and that would fall into this category. So uh, this dichotomy, what happens when you're young versus what happens with your old in terms of appropriate renal repair versus inappropriate renal repair and setting yourself up for you know, those, those cells that cannot recover or those cells that become senescent and um, further exacerbating this process. And so again, what can we do? Well, interestingly enough, just hypertension, addressing hypertension is quite important based on the literature that's out there. So hypertension is associated with short telomeres in humans and rodents, I mentioned that, and significantly shorter telomeres in hypertensive cats with kidney disease. So we found that in our study. I was not actually expecting that. And this was even cats who were on therapy for their hypertension. So we, we graded it as yes or no, ever hypertensive, and we actually still found shorter telomeres in those cats that were yes, ever hypertensive, even if they were on therapy. So that was a really interesting outcome. 
Furthermore, this more recent study, I think, is really pivotal in this area because it demonstrated that renal telomere length shortens after the development of hypertension. Because you can argue causation versus correlation, but this study kind of very nicely indicated that, in fact, hypertension is really exacerbating this situation. And when it comes to human patients, it's also been demonstrated that antihypertensive therapy ameliorated telomere attrition in those human chronic kidney disease patients. So we do have a decent amount of evidence about the importance of identifying and addressing hypertension in those patients. And that's even aside from all the other important things, right? Like retinal damage and how they're feeling and their quality of life. Think about it on a pathophysiologic um, level as well and the importance of that. I also want to talk about oxidative stress. I think oxidative stress is something that we don't think about enough. I definitely worry about oxidative stress um, and its interplay with senescence. So from the standpoint of it being a major driver of P16 mediated senescence um, and then a whole host of other concerns with oxidative stress as well. As I mentioned previously, telomeres are exquisitely sensitive to oxidative injury, um, and that dysfunction is actually different than that concept of telomere shortening. And that's been a little hard for us to get at in terms of what we can do in the cat kidney, but that has been demonstrated in other species. And the bottom line is that the kidney is, the kidney especially in probably, I would say any species, but it, particularly from what we know about the cat kidney, there is oxidative stress. I mean, I may not be able to prove it very well, but everything tells me it's not good. So when we think about the concept of you're a nephron, you've just lost 75% of all of the other nephrons around you, you're the only nephrons left, you're doing the job of, of all of the metabolism and the filtration of the kidney, you are in metabolic overload, you're in your hyperfiltration um, as well, and that is definitely metabolic stress for those cells. Furthermore, they're not getting the nutrients that they need because their vasculature is disrupted. So we have fibrosis, we have capillary rarefaction, meaning that that vasculature is actually pushed away from the tubules. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And then when you add in things like anemia and dehydration, that's a very hypoxic kidney. And again, hypoxia is a driver of fibrosis. So I get very concerned about that, that environment in the kidney and what that could mean um, in terms of these concepts. We also know RAS activation, uremic toxins have a huge effect on oxidative stress as well. That's been shown in, in multiple species. And so I want to just spend a moment talking about capillary rarefaction. This is something that um, one of our, our residents, this was her, her project over time, she has, she has lovingly counted every little tiny capillary. So we, we basically uh, looked, at, <laughs> we looked at these, she imaged them, she colored them all, she identified them using um, stains and then counted all of these capillaries in normal cats, uh, iris stage two, iris stage four. And the concept of this is when you're looking at these, I've used the color picture. When you're looking at the colored picture, on the top we have a normal cat kidney and on the bottom you very obviously have a disrupted kidney. But look at the, the, the spread then in your capillary network. So this is that beautiful capillary network that should be surrounding the tubule, providing it with nutrients, providing it with its oxygen, et cetera. It is not getting the um, it's not getting the perfusion that it needs. And again, so this is the concept of capillary rarefaction. It's been shown in humans and rodents, and it's again one of these hallmarks in terms of that hypoxia and that drive towards fibrosis. So we now know as well that that's present in feline chronic kidney disease, and that those tubules stuck somewhere in the middle of there are really going to be struggling metabolically, and that's very likely contributing to their oxidative stress. So we, we have at least um, one or two papers that describe oxidative stress looking at urinary uh, F2 isoprostanes. And interestingly, this study did not turn out the way that we thought it was going to. So we, we proposed that cats with kidney disease would have increased oxidative stress, and I assumed it would worsen with the stages of kidney disease. But now two studies have shown that it was significantly higher in stage one chronic kidney disease and then decreased with iris stage over time. And we don't 
actually have a great explanation for this at this time, but one thing that it does indicate to me is that there are, there, there are detrimental processes going on in early stage kidney disease, and also very likely than I would worry in those aged kidneys. So the process starts early, we just don't appreciate it clinically. And interestingly enough, in one of these um, uh, studies, um, there was an effect with diet as well. And so I do think oxidative stress has a significant potential as a therapeutic target as well. Unfortunately, it's not as straightforward as just give them an antioxidant, everything will be better. So it's been shown in various studies that it matters when and how much and for what type of renal dysfunction you're thinking about oxidative stress. So N-acetylcysteine, for example, these are just some examples I pulled out of the literature. N-acetylcysteine in chronic kidney disease, it looks quite good. Uh, but then if you're looking at AKI, uh, it, you get a very different effect. So when, where, how much, unfortunately, the timing really matters with some of these processes. Bardoxolone had a lot of press for several years, but then there was actually a clinical trial in diabetic nephropathy that was halted because of adverse effects um, during that study. So it's unfortunately not quite as straightforward as we would like to think, and I think we need a lot more study in this area because it is very important, and knowing how to go forward would, would be um, really important. And then the next category that I would like to talk about is modulation of SAF, so xenomorphics. So here, the goal is to limit those detrimental paracrine effects of senescent cells that I mentioned. And I will just briefly say that, again, there's multiple studies out there um, about things that could work as xenomorphics. We happen to have a clinical trial for rapamycin looking at this as an agent currently. Um, um, but again, every time I pull up one of these substances in the literature, you're going to see a whole slew of rodent models and then starting to have clinical application in this regard. So that's the category of xenomorphics. And again, we're targeting pro-inflammatory signaling pathways here with the, the point of trying to decrease that, those paracrine effects um, of those senescent cells. Next actually targeting the selective clearance of those senescent cells. So can I actually remove those senescent cells so that they're no longer having that effect on bystander cells? So um, I think this is a really fascinating area as well. Uh, again, in my first reading of this, it comes off, uh, you know, as, as Isaac Asimov said, today's science fiction is tomorrow's science. And this is it really the category that this fell in for me originally, but the more I've read and the more advances are made, there are some very compelling things here as well. So what do we mean when we're, we're actually targeting these cells? Well, most strategies in this area focus on apoptosis, again, getting rid of those senescent cells. They're very resistant to apoptosis. They have upregulation of anti-apoptotic genes. Um, and tumor cells are very similar in that way. So interestingly enough, there's a lot of oncologic therapies that are applicable here in this scenario. And some medications, drugs we actually have used, um, have been used already, could be reapplied here in a different way. So um, when it comes to thinking about, again, the list is long in terms of what we could use. Um, so I won't go into this in detail, but I'll show you a couple of examples of some of these things that have been explored and what the potential outcomes might be. So here's a study where we have one of these senolytics, and um, the long story short is that we see improvement in renal values. I'm not even sure that was really the targeted outcome uh, uh, for this particular study, but from my standpoint, that's an interesting outcome to be looking at. Things like decitinib and quercetin, so um, when we're looking here, this is actually an ischemia reperfusion model. I get particularly interested in ischemia models um, in the rodent literature because I, again, I worry about how sensitive the feline kitty might be to ischemia events. Um, we do have some ischemia, ischemia models in cats, um, in research cats, that the outcome of those are very similar to what we see in chronic kidney disease. So ischemic events, those little injury uh, events, might be a big part of it. So I, I pay more close attention to these types of studies. Here, um, when you look at um, the actual damaged mice, so obviously the highest bar on this graph versus the treated mice, there is a significant difference, again, in P16 in these particular animals. So I think that's really important to realize that these things are being studied. We are seeing interesting um, and potentially very applicable renal outcomes. 
Here's what the looks like in terms of histopathology. I would pay the most attention again to this column here. This is the, the damaged mice. And then you have your mice that received therapy. This would be a marker of fibrosis here. And you see definitely an improved outcome um, in, that particular, um, in that particular histopathologic uh, figure. However, again here, timing matters. So there have been a lot of controversial results from the standpoint of AKI versus chronic kidney disease. Um, when do we intercede? And so those are things that will, I think, absolutely be hurdles for these types of therapies. Other hurdles to think of? Well, there's always been the question of, is there a concern for knee plasia? But again, there's some overlap here in between oncology and the, the concept these oncologic drugs actually hold promise. The other big thing would be a lot of these substances are actually not very specific. So what are the side effects of very broad reaching therapeutic targets? Um, things like di disturbance of repair and wound healing. We don't have a good concept of that in terms of moving into the clinical space. And then questions like, would it be ideal to deliver the drug um, appropriately to the area of interest? Like, would I actually deliver it directly to the kidney? So in summary, I hope I have convinced you that renal aging is a key part of this picture. I hope I have convinced you that senescence is a key part of this picture and that it's really pivotal when we think about that transition from aging to disease and what it could mean for this very, very prominent disease in our feline patients. And my big question, of course, is how do we slow the onset of chronic kidney disease? How do we think about renal aging and promote kidney health even before we get to the point of having kidney disease? Could we actually move that onset of disease in terms of our, of, you know, that timeline for our clinical patients. So how do we do that? Well, right now, again, be kind to the kidney. Think about addressing pro-senescent factors, and then, of course, stay tuned to this space for novel therapies, because I, I do think there are absolutely um, treatments that are being explored, and you will see them in the clinic, and your, your clients may be even buying them off Amazon right now. So I think it's important to know what these substances are supposed to be doing and honestly what evidence we have um, that they are doing them. So thank you so much for your attention today. Um, if you'd like to know a little bit more about our research program, my, my graduate state and, uh, student, Caitlin Brusak, made this amazing QR code that has a kidney on it. I didn't know you could do that. So please check us out um, in terms of the different things that we have underway for clinical trials for cats with chronic kidney disease. But thank you so much for your attention today.